Hey guys, all right, today we're watching Battle of Hatin, 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 1187, Saladin's Greatest Victory by History Marsh. I love History Marsh's videos. Um, as I've said before, I don't really react to battle videos, but I think I'm going to change that, and I'm going to start reacting to battle videos because, well, that's kind of what a lot of history content is on YouTube. Um... So, yeah. But also, I love Saladin. I think he... I mean, yeah, he was on the 100 greatest uh, military generals list. Um, he's a brilliant mind. Uh, he's a very respectful person towards his enemies still. Uh, despite, perhaps, the possibilities that even if they may not have been respectful towards him, him and Richard the Lionheart famously had a very positive, I guess enemy relationship they respected one another um as generals and leaders and whatnot uh so yeah let's go ahead and watch this video i warn you against shedding blood indulging in it and making a habit of it for blood never sleeps saladin during the second half of the 12th century a dramatic yes, Muslim revival reaches its so zenith long. under the command of Salah ad-Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub, a courageous and brilliant leader known to contemporary Muslims as Al-Nasir, the Victorious, and to Europeans as Salah ad-Din. He seeks nothing less than to unite all Muslims between the Euphrates and the Nile against a common enemy. Oh, this animation, dude. This animation. In the late 11th century, the Fatimid Caliphate is in decline, and the Seljuk Empire is crumbling. In this period of Muslim weakness, the First Crusade strikes the Levant. Christian lords and knights impose institutions of Western Europe upon the social and political structures of the conquered lands. Their rule is relatively stable, largely thanks to Muslim disunity. But yes. as the 12th century... Oh, that's such an excellent point to add. Um, he made some great uh, mentions here. First, the imposing Western ideology and rule... And their form of rule over uh, largely Islamic land, which has been, by 1187, has been Islamic land for 500 or so years. Um, 400, five, 400 to 500 years by this point, I believe. Um, so, this land, very Muslim. <laughs> uh, so, they that's the rule. But... Also, you have to then think about there's a lot of Islamic disunity here. So that also aided the uh, Western European Catholic country. rolls on. In Less than five maintaining decades stable since control. European crusaders arrived in the region, the Zengid dynasty rises to prominence in northern Levant. Under competent leadership of Imad Adin Zengi, they defeat the crusaders and retake the city of Edessa in 1144. Thus, in effect, provoking the Pope to call for the Second Crusade. Crusade 2, final. <laughs> Although Imad is assassinated two years later, in 1146, his... Oh, I just love their videos, how they edit the map changes too, like that. Oh, that's so Kuradin cool. ...successfully continues the fight against the Crusaders, until the Second Crusade eventually fizzles out, and he expands his father's realm over the years, bringing much-needed stability and prosperity to his people. It is during Nur ad-Din's reign that Saladin begins his rise to prominence. Born in 1137 in Tikrit, in modern-day Iraq, Saladin spends his formative years in Damascus. From a young age, he is educated in Greek philosophy, mathematics, poetry, astronomy, law, and above all, he becomes an ardent student of the Quran and theology. His upbringing is helped by members of his family, who served as skillful diplomats and administrators, first in the Seljuk Empire, and later for the Zengid dynasty. 
Growing up, Saladin's uncle Shakur and Nur ad Din become his biggest role models. They instilled in him the principles of chivalry, piety, nobility, justice, humility, generosity, brotherhood, mercy and forgiveness, all of which would come to define Saladin's life and legacy. He joins the military at the age of 14 and is ably trained by his uncle Shakur, a military commander in the Zengid army. A quick learner, Saladin soon impresses his mentor. His performance in early battles enables him to take on leading responsibilities in military campaigns, and over the years, he distinguishes himself through his bravery. How young did he excel, though? Like, at the age of 14? <laughs> That's impressive. Military leadership, sharp intellect, and loyalty to his leaders. Saladin's star truly begins to rise in the 1160s when Nur ad Din intervenes in the affairs of the weakening Fatimid Caliphate, aiming to forestall the Malric's quest to expand the Kingdom of Jerusalem into Egypt. Recognized as a competent, trustworthy, and ambitious leader, in 1164, Saladin is sent to Egypt as part of the command structure of a Zengid army commanded by his uncle Shakur. He becomes an integral part of several campaigns over the years, and his uncle's second in command. By early 1169, the army of Amalric I, King of Jerusalem, is finally expelled from Egypt. Saladin's uncle Shakur is named vizier of the Fatimid Caliph al Adid, which gives Nur ad Din de facto control over Egypt. Hmm. But just one month later, in March 1169, Shakur suddenly dies after a short illness. Without his right-hand man, oh, no. Nur ad Din's influence in Egypt is threatened. al Adid senses an opportunity to strengthen his own position and quickly appoints Salah ad Din without waiting for a decision from Damascus, thinking that a young vizier with no political power in Egypt will be easy to control. However, the 31-year-old Saladin proves to be more than what al Adid has bargained for. The young vizier takes advantage of the Fatimid political system, and through clever tactics, he gradually installs his close family members in key government and military positions, which enables him to consolidate his power enough to overthrow and dissolve the Fatimid Shia Caliphate just two years Absolute later in 1171, thus founding the Ayyubid dynasty. Saladin can now concentrate on strengthening Egypt as a bastion of Sunni Muslim power, with himself as governor in the name of Nur ad Din. He revitalizes the economy, establishes civic institutions, and greatly improves education by building a law college in Alexandria and a vast number of schools all over Egypt, giving school administrators and teachers good salaries, which attracts many scholars from across Asia and Europe turning Egypt into an intellectual powerhouse of the 12th century. He abolishes tolls for Muslim pilgrims who cross the Red Sea and pays compensation to Mecca for any loss of income, a shrewd move that makes him popular among the people and also makes him a patron of Mecca. Saladin Ooh, transforms Egypt into a salient against the Crusaders by creating an entirely new army loyal only to him and starts rebuilding the navy to protect Egypt's coasts. Military forays soon follow to secure and expand the borders, first against Nubia, where hostile remnants of the Fatimid establishment still persist. Then into Libya, where Ayyubid armies push west to Tripoli and expel the Norman occupiers. Although Salah ad Din never manages to consolidate his authority west of the province of Barqa. Most importantly, Salah ad Din turns his attention towards tightening his grip over Hejaz and captures Yemen thus gaining control over the Red Sea and its vast maritime trading potential, which God immensely damn. increases Egypt's commercial wealth. By all accounts, Saladin is actively building an empire, which creates friction with Nur ad Din, his master in Syria. Tensions rise and almost result in conflict, but then Nur ad Din dies suddenly in 1174, probably of a heart attack. Pro probably? Yo, I think he was murdered. I think he was fucking murdered. In the ensuing power vacuum, his 11-year-old son, al Salih cannot fill the void left by his father's death. But Salah Din can. And he now sees before him a grand vision. He can unite Egypt and Syria for a holy war against the Christian invaders. 
He proclaims the need for unity and jihad as reasons to intervene in Syria, and his claims are not without merit. By controlling the Red Sea, or by reconquering the area south of the Shorbak Castle, Saladin is already recognized as the liberator of the Hajj Road. Securing pilgrimage routes from Sudan and Egypt to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina earns him a lot of credibility, and as a result, his arrival into Syria is much welcomed by ordinary people, but not so much by some members of the Zengid dynasty. Nevertheless, Salah Adin brings most of the Zengid territory under his control, either through diplomacy or military intervention, thus becoming the Sultan of Egypt and Syria. Damn. Meanwhile, across the border, King Amalric plans to exploit the political instability in Syria and expand his territory. But he dies of dysentery in July 1174. Ooh, rip. In Salah Adin's view, Amalric's death the is a sign of God's favor. With the throne passing to Baldwin IV, a mere boy suffering from leprosy, and the Frankish nobles angling for positions in the kingdom, the threat of a major Christian invasion subsides. But Saladin knows that the time is not yet right to fight the Crusaders, as he must consolidate his position against Nur ad-Din's relatives, who still pose a threat from their bases in Aleppo and Mosul. But as Baldwin IV matures, the kingdom adopts a proactive foreign policy. The Crusaders try to take Hama and Harim, but fail in the attempt. In 1177, Saladin responds by leading a large invasion force into the Kingdom of Jerusalem to counter the Frankish aggression. Baldwin, now 16 years old, despite being vastly outnumbered, proves he is a capable leader, able to unite hmm. his nobles against the Muslim threat, and with the help of Reynaud of Chatillon, his second in command, he manages to catch Saladin by surprise at Montgizard due to a rare tactical error by the Sultan. Saladin suffers a crushing defeat, narrowly escaping with his own life, with many of his army killed or taken prisoner. Ooh. But Baldwin lacks the resources to follow up on the victory, and the Sultan manages to regroup. In April 1179, Saladin strikes back and decisively defeats Baldwin in the Golan region, nearly capturing the king. Another Christian army is defeated in June of the same year, and just two months later, an important Templar fortress situated on the pilgrimage route is destroyed. Finally, in 1180, Salah Adin and Baldwin agree a two-year truce. But even before the ink is dry, it is clear that the mighty fortress of Karak will become the next flashpoint. Virtually impenetrable, Atop a steep hill, with its 80-meter entrance tunnel and walls thick enough to withstand the battering of siege weapons, Karak is the home of Reynaud of Chatillon. His fortress sits on the key road between Damascus and Mecca, and from there, the Baron is able to tax, raid, and rob the passing camel caravans of traders and pilgrims. Reynaud is the most perfidious, the most evil of the Franks, the greediest, the most zealous to do harm. Imad ad Imad Adin. Uh, Isfahani. Oh, fuck. I cannot pronounce <laughs> Islamic names. Truce or no truce, Reynaud thinks that Muslims should not be allowed to pass freely. In the summer of 1181, he rides deep into Arabia and intercepts a major Muslim caravan, strips the travelers of their possessions, and takes many prisoners. Oh, that's a dick move. Saladin demands compensation from Baldwin, but the king cannot force Reynaud to recompense. Saladin holds a group of Christian pilgrims hostage as leverage, but Reynold still refuses to free the Muslim pilgrims. In response, Christian pilgrims are sold into slavery. Oh, then in shit. 1182, Reynold puts more strain on the already delicate truce. The rogue crusader sends troops via the Red Sea, declaring that he will destroy the Kaaba and exhume the Prophet's tomb in Hijaz. But thanks to Saladin's naval reforms, Egypt is well prepared. Al-Adil, Saladin's brother and governor of Egypt, dispatches the Ayyubid fleet. Most of the Christian raiders are captured and executed on the orders from the Sultan. Eulogies of Saladin abound in the Muslim community, as he is yet again seen as the protector of Islamic holy places and pilgrimage routes. And then... God, I wonder... Oh, man. How would Islam have changed if Reynold's plan there had succeeded? God, I'm so, that is an interesting what-if scenario there. Damn.
Is that a direct attack on Mecca? Wow. Ooh. The tide turns in favor oh of the boy. Muslims. In 1183, Aleppo finally surrenders to Saladin, who now becomes the mightiest ruler of the Muslim world and the leader of a unified Muslim front against the Latin Crusaders. Exercising uncontested authority over Egypt and Syria, he is supported by the Sunni Caliph in Baghdad and is recognized as the Lord of Arabia and patron of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. But most importantly, ordinary Muslims that Saladin sought to bring together are jubilant that Islam is again united. The news of Saladin's conquest of Aleppo shocks the Crusader states. The Christians knew that if Saladin could conquer that city, then their country could be swept and besieged in every part. Saladin can now direct his vast resources to put pressure on the Kingdom of Jerusalem almost along its entire border. A devastating raid into Christian lands is followed by several probing attacks on the fortress of Karak, testing the resolve of the Franks and putting strain on their resources. To make matters worse for the Crusaders, the tragic life of Baldwin IV is over. The king's oh. final act was to try and secure peace by sending Raymond of Tripoli to negotiate a four-year truce, which Saladin readily agrees to because he has problems of his own with the Zengid ruler in Mosul, who is forming a coalition against him. But the leper king's successor, Baldwin V, is a sickly child, and he dies just a year later, triggering a succession crisis. After a period of political turmoil, the throne passes on to Baldwin IV's sister, who in turn crowns her husband, Guy of Lusignan, as king of Jerusalem. But the new king is not able to control his vassal nobles. Then comes troubling news from the south. In December 1186, Reynaud of Chatillon once again violates the truce. He overruns another ridge caravan, slaughters and imprisons many Muslims. Saladin immediately damn, dispatches Reynaud. an envoy, demanding the return of hostages and treasure, threatening the truce breaker with vengeance. <coughs> but Reynaud, resting on his laurels behind the walls of Karak, refuses to even receive the envoy. Upon Siege hearing of this, Muhammad Saladin finally loses his patience and swears that he will take the life of Reynaud with his own hand. His anger, beyond words, beyond bounds. Just in early viable. 1187, Saladin gathers his, his generals in Damascus to draw up plans for a major invasion. Messengers gallop to all corners of the state, urging action, vengeance, a war of liberation and annihilation. The words Jihad and Jerusalem are on the lips of all Muslims who answer Saladin's call. Saladin leaves garrisons along the border to protect the northern flank and begins raiding Christian lands. During one of the raids, a chance encounter between a Muslim cavalry advance guard and a Christian contingent of 130 knights, 410 capoles and infantry at the springs of Cresson ends in disaster for the Templars and hospitaliers. Heads of knights on lances and prisoners chained to horses are paraded in front of Tiberius. The calamity at the springs of Cresson is a wake-up call for the Christians, who quickly mend old rivalries and unite in the face of the conflict that is coming. On June 26th, 1187, Saladin regroups his troops and marches towards the River Jordan. His army numbers around 30,000 and is divided into three wings. Damn, with that's Takiyadin a lot of cavalry. commanding the right, Kukburi commanding the left, and Saladin himself in the center. On June 27th, the army reaches the River Jordan and makes camp in a marshy area near Lake Tiberius. Raiding parties are sent into Christian territory to ravage the area and set the stage for the invasion. Some 25 kilometers west, a Christian army some 20,000 strong encamps in Sephoria, a highly strategic location because of its rich water resources. On June 30th, Saladin sends a contingent north to block the town of Tiberias and then challenges the Crusaders by moving his main camp closer to Sephoria, some 10 kilometers west of Lake Tiberias. But as neither side takes action, Saladin decides to make the first move. On July 1st, he sends scouts to monitor an alternative road on his northern flank that connects Safuria and Tiberias. 
Later in the day, reports confirmed that the Crusaders are not advancing on either route, and on July 2nd, Saladin takes the initiative. He marches east towards Tiberias with most of his infantry, a cavalry contingent, siege engineers, and their equipment. By late morning, they reach Tiberias, where Raymond's wife is staying, and they besiege the town. Not long after, Muslim troops breach the wall, and the town is seized by nightfall. Raymond's wife barricades herself inside the citadel with her guards, and sends messengers urging King Guy to send help. Back west, plumes of smoke can be seen in the sky above Tiberias, and when news of the siege reaches the Crusader camp, King Guy holds council to debate what should be done. At first, Raymond of Tripoli makes a persuasive argument against marching to raise the siege, insisting that the Christian army has a strong defensive position at Sephuria and should stay put. But the Count's cautiousness is met with accusations of cowardice and treachery, mainly from the Templar master, Gerard de Ridefort and Reynaud of Châtillon, who push for a more aggressive stance and put pressure on King Guy with strong political, military and diplomatic arguments. Persuaded, the king sends a herald through the camp to sound the call that the army will march to the rescue of Tiberius at dawn. And on July 3rd, the Crusader army makes way. They set out with Raymond of Tripoli commanding the vanguard. This is a cool leads the center, key where the Bishop of Acre carries right Christendom's greatest relic, the true cross, on which Christ is believed to have been crucified. Balian of Iblin commands the rear guard, where the Templars and Hospitaliers are stationed. King Guy orders the men to march with haste, planning to reach the besieged town by the end of the day. But as noon approaches and the sun rises across the clear, cloudless sky, it becomes apparent that the day will be extremely hot. There is no breeze and the scorching heat slows down the column. By midday, the army reaches the next watering point at the village of Tehran, only one third of the way. But as they press on, there is no escaping the sun and the thick dust raised by the marching troops. It becomes clear to King Guy and his officers that they will not reach Tiberius in a single day. As the column moves away from Tehran, detachments of Saladin's fast-moving horse archers appear from nearby hills and begin harassing the Christians, cutting off their line of retreat. The Crusader infantry closes ranks to protect the cavalry against hit-and-run attacks, but the number of casualties in men and animals begins to rise. The day wears on, and the constant harassment and sporadic clashes slow the Crusader rearguard down to a crawl, and they become separated from the rest of the army. Fearing the loss of his elite shock cavalry, King Guy orders the center to stop to allow the rearguard to catch up. He relays the message to Raymond, ordering him to halt the vanguard. But as the entire Crusader column gradually gets encircled by the ever-increasing number of Saladin's horse archers, it becomes clear that they have fallen into a trap. God damn. After quickly taking Tiberius, Saladin had time to return, leaving only a small garrison to block the citadel. And with his main contingent, he is now blocking the road. With nightfall fast approaching, the exhausted Christian fighters, slowed by thirst and hemmed in by Muslim forces, cannot fight their way past Saladin's fresh troops. King Guy has no choice but to order his men to make camp where they stand. Not far from the king's tent, the main Muslim contingent also encamps for the night. But the night ahead will be a difficult one for the Crusaders. Their they column don't have water. stretches some two kilometers, and it's not protected by any natural terrain features. Muslim horse archers continue to pepper the camp throughout the night. Skirmishers clash with the Crusaders and set tents on fire along the camp perimeter. Unable to rest, and with their water supplies dwindling, the smoke and the heat from the fire drains the energy from the Christians. Come morning, things quiet down. Saladin waits for the heat to rise and to see what the Christians will do. Crusaders, now without any water and tormented by thirst, have only one aim, the village of Hatim, where there is a water source. They make way across the but valley, to keeping Tehran. the same formation of three squares, be to go with back infantry to shielding the cavalry. Saladin's troops set fire to the nearby brushwood, sending choking clouds of smoke on a westerly breeze towards the Crusaders. 
And with the sun God, beating down from the so clear sky, ingenious. the Christians push on towards Hatim, desperate to reach its water well. To prevent this, Saladin sends Taki al dins wing galloping to block the valley, determined to fully encircle the enemy and not allow them to quench their thirst. He especially wants to wear down the knights and their cavalry, aware of just how dangerous their frontal charge is. Taki skirmishers, riding close, then hit and run to test the flanks of the Christians. Horse archers then unleash volley after volley onto the Crusader column. Exhausted, thirsty and disheartened, the Crusader infantry starts to break away from the mounted knights. They disperse and flee, with a large group heading east towards a hill called the Horns of Hatim, and another group fleeing north towards the village of Nimrin. Seeing the fleeing troops, Muslim riders open gaps in their line to draw out the enemy infantry. King Guy and his officers realize they are doomed unless they can break through. But the Muslims charge the rear of the column, and the Templars and Hospitaliers become heavily engaged, forcing Guy to halt for a second time to prevent the cavalry formations from breaking up. But in the front, Raymond of Tripoli is already edging away from King Guy's cavalry formation. As he advances, the Muslim riders begin opening another gap in their line. Raymond decides not to sit and wait. He gathers his knights and charges Taki al dins cavalry. The Muslim riders let the galloping Christians pass through, showering Raymond and his men with arrows as they retreat from the battlefield. Back in the smoke-filled valley, Raymond's Christian just eaten out of there. Dying. What? Guy orders the cavalry to move towards the horns of Hatim through a gap already created by the retreating infantry. He knows that there are shallow pools of water at the top of the hill and hopes they are not dry. Meanwhile, on the hill, Saladin's troops close in and engage the Christian infantry. Exhausted, the enemy infantry barely put up a fight and they are quickly overwhelmed. The Muslims then turn towards the king of Jerusalem himself. Throughout the incessant close quarter fighting, well, Christian Dalian's knights also gather around to protect the true cross as they retreat towards the hill. But at the top, they find no relief and no water. King Guy rallies his knights and raises his red tent to provide a focal point, but to no avail. Muslim troops push up the slope and engage the Christians. In the melee, the true cross falls into Muslim hands. Seeing this, the surviving Christian knights rally and charge downhill to retrieve it, pushing the Muslim line back. But they have no fight left in them and soon begin to take heavy casualties. Finally, King Guy orders them to surrender. The knights dismount and collapse on the ground. King Guy is also found on the ground at his tent, utterly exhausted, barely having enough strength left to hand over his sword. Saladin's army has won a great victory. King Guy is captured along with many nobles and knights, among them, Reynaud of Chatillon. Saladin orders that ice water be brought and offered to the king. Then, according to Imad al-Din, the king, having drunk some of it, handed the cup to Reynaud of Shatia. Whereupon the sultan said to an interpreter, Say to the king, it is you who give him to drink, but I give him neither to drink nor to eat. By these words, Salah al-Din wishes that it be understood that honor forbade him to harm any man who has tasted his hospitality. And with that, he swings his sword and strikes Reynaud on the neck thus fulfilling his oath to kill the truce breaker. But more Damn. importantly, the large crusader army that is destroyed at Hatim cannot be replaced. Without it, Christian castles, towns and cities are now defenseless. By 1188, only Tyre and Antioch hold out to spur Europe to embark on another crusade. But that is a story for another time. It is worth oh. noting that we mainly focused on Saladin's military achievements in this video, but there is much more to the man who was admired by his European enemies and loved by his fellow Muslims. Saladin was a courageous Muslim leader whose firm foundation in the religion and its prime values led to his commitment to the Islamic cause. In just 12 years, he united Mesopotamia, Syria, Egypt, Eastern Libya, Western Damn. Arabia, and Yemen, using his skills in diplomacy and administration to piece together this divided region. 
His scope of vision was that he gave each situation its due attention and weight, and he never broke a bridge of diplomacy or peace initiative with his opponents. The power or wealth he acquired never spoiled him. He was a man of restless energy, geared to serve his goal Damn. in driving the invaders out of Muslim Damn. lands. This is an impressive fucking dude. We highly recommend you check out the sources we used for this video to learn more about one of the greatest princes of Islam. And as always, the link to their video is down below so that you guys can also access the original video. And also, as they say here, check out the sources. Um, Saladin's victory at the Horns of Hattin paved the way for further Islamic inroads into Christian territory and precipitated the fall of Acre, Jaffa, Gaza, and the city of Jerusalem, along with some 50 Crusader castles. Wow. Um, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, History Marsh always makes some amazing content. They do excellent research. Amazingly well uh, animated videos. Uh, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I hope you guys enjoyed. I will, of course, be reacting to more History Marsh videos in the future. Uh, but for now, uh, leave a suggestion down below for what you want to see me react to next. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.